Good afternoon and welcome to ASE's Guideline Webinar Series. I am Mary Lawson, CME Coordinator for ASE. Today's webinar is titled Recommendations for Multimodality Cardiac Imaging in Patients with Chagas Disease. Before I get started, I have just a few housekeeping items that I would like to go over with you. Since this is a live webinar, you have the opportunity to have your questions answered by the speaker. To ask the speaker a question, use the Questions tab on the left side of your screen. Feel free to ask a question at any point during the presentation. However, keep in mind that questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We will do our best to ensure that all questions are answered, however, this may not be possible depending upon the number of questions presented. I would also like to point out a feature for those that wish to take notes during the presentation. When you click on the Notes tab on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see a white text box where you can take notes during today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the presentation. Lastly, we will be issuing polling questions throughout the session. When these come up, you will have a limited amount of time to answer the poll in the center of your screen. Simply click on the option you wish to vote for. The results will appear on the polling tab on the left-hand side of your player. If you are interested in a PDF copy of the PowerPoint, you can click on the Resources tab of, on the left-hand side of the player. Simply click on any of the file names to initiate the download. Instructions on how to claim your CME will also be posted here. Also, if you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, you can click on the Request Support button in the lower left side of the player, and we have a technical expert there to help out with whatever problems you may have. Without any further delay, let me introduce today's speaker. Federico M. Ash, MD, FACC Phase, is the Director of Cardiovascular Core Labs and Cardiac Imaging Research at MedStar Health Research Institute and Heart and Vascular Institute, Associate Professor of Medicine at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. His initial experience with Chagas disease dates from his training years at Instituto Cardiovascular de Buenos Aires. An active leader in ASE, he is chair of the Guidelines and Standards Committee, member of the Board of Directors, and has been a member of the Scientific Sessions Planning and International Relations Committee, among with other roles within ASE. It is our honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Ash. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, it's my real pleasure, um, everyone, to uh, be able to present to you um, the uh, result of work um, that we have been doing with a group of um, experts in uh, Chagas disease over the last uh, year or year and a half that resulted in um, the uh, Recommendations for Multimodality Cardiac Imaging in Patients with Chagas Disease, which is a report led by the American Society of ECHO, but done uh, with the very important collaboration of uh, two of our partner societies, echo SIAC, um, which uh, has representatives from uh, all over uh, America, uh, the America, the continent, and uh, from the Brazilian Society of Cardiology, their um, cardiovascular imaging department. As you can see in this slide, the group of authors really represents the broad spectrum of, um, uh, of experts from many countries um, uh, across the entire America. And that's what I'm going to be presenting today. The learning objectives for today are to uh, appreciate the epidemiology of Chagas disease and detail its contemporary geographic distribution worldwide and in the United States, to recognize the potential role of multiple cardiac imaging modalities in the management of patients with Chagas uh, disease and Chagas heart disease, to characterize the clinical phases of trypanosoma cruzi infection, acute Chagas disease in the terminal stages and the different stages within the chronic spectrum, to define the overall goals of imaging in the different stages of Chagas heart disease, and to recognize the special features of the electrocardiogram and other imaging modalities in relation to Chagas disease. You can see here the outline of what will be uh, the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes of presentation. We will talk about the epidemiology of the disease and the physiopathology as it relates to imaging. We're going to talk about uh, features for electrocardiogram and imaging uh, uh, examination modalities, and we will talk about the different stages um, of the disease. 
Within each of these three bigger topics, we will go through some very basic concepts, uh, through some examples, and what we as a group have recommended uh, in our document. So let, let's start with the epidemiology and pathology. Um, the um, Chagas disease it has been described thoroughly uh, about a hundred years ago by a Brazilian called Carlos Chagas, uh, initially described as mostly a rural disease and has been a rural disease in many countries in Latin America for many years. However, over the last uh, several decades, this disease has actually migrated into the cities and it, into different countries. This is a disease, uh, it's an infectious disease, and it's uh, caused by a parasite that is called Trypanosoma cruzi. This parasite is, is um, uh, transmitted through a, a, a vector that has different names in different countries. As a matter of fact, it's not just a single vector, it's a family of different bugs that we call in English uh, kissing bug, uh, but it's also known as Barbeiro in Brazil, as uh, Vinchuca in um, Argentina and other countries in South America, and mostly known as Chinche in Central America countries. This is transmitted by a vector, as I mentioned. Uh, that vector, which is the uh, kissing bug, uh, transmits the disease, the parasite, through their bites mostly, but it can actually transfer also through blood transfusions or transplantation of organs that are infected, can be transferred through, uh, from a mother to fetus uh, transmission or in some cases with oral contamination. The important thing is that with any of these ways of transmission, the parasite will get into the human blood and from there on the disease will develop. So I'm going to start with one question that has no right answer. And that question is, how often do you see Chagas heart disease in your practice? I do not live in South America, no need to look for it. I have not been looking for it. I don't think of it on a regular basis. Rarely, but it's something I consider in my differential when dealing with dilated cardiomyopathy in specific populations. Very frequently, it's highly prevalent in my area, or I am not sure how to look for it. Maybe I'll start doing that after today. So I'm going to give you a few seconds uh, to poll your questions, to your answers to this question, and uh, we will move on. Again, there's no right answer for this question. It's just for me to have a good idea of how much you know about the disease and how much we can learn today. So while historically linked only to Latin America, migration has really changed the geographic distribution of Chagas disease. The map that I am showing here is a map that um, uh, the World Health Organization put together back in 2011. And it's a, a very um, good map because it shows two different things. Um, the size of the circles that you see there reflects how many estimated number of cases on each of the countries in the world are uh, described. And you can see the smaller um, uh, circles are the ones for countries that have very few cases, and then the biggest ones are countries that have more than a million cases, estimated cases, such as Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico. On the other hand, the color of these figures reflect the status of that vector transmission, that uh, the, the, the status of those kissing bugs and whether those transmit the infection or not. And as you can see in gray, you see countries without the vector transmission, such as all the countries in Europe, Japan, and Australia. And then on light blue, you see countries where there is a vector and there are accidental cases of um, transmission, such as you can see for Uruguay, Chile, and many other countries. And then in dark blue is really those where uh, there's a lot of vector transmission through the, um, the, the kissing bug, as you can see in Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. Um, so should we care? We won't really see it in the United States. That's kind of a, a, a frequent um, 
statement. And when I look at the answers uh, to the, the first question that you pull here, um, it's, it's clear that few of you have actually significant experience. So I'm really glad that there's a lot of room for having an impact with my presentation today. Um, this is the United States, and this is the estimated um, number of cases that we could see in the United States today. And what, what this is, is basically listing um, most countries in, um, in America, and for each of these countries you can see the uh, approximate number of immigrants that live in the United States, and then the prevalence on the country of origin for each of these countries, and based on these two numbers, then we can estimate the number of immigrants living in the United States that have positive infection with Trypanosoma cruzi. And it's quite interesting to see that at the very bottom of your table here, we come up with about 300,000 people living in the United States that are infected with Chagas disease. So if I go back to the same map that I showed you before. The United States has a significant number of, um, uh, of cases, um, and indeed you see it in light blue, which means that there are uh, kissing bugs that can potentially transmit the disease. As a matter of fact, this has been described in most states within the uh, United States, and certainly uh, more prone to happen in the southern states than in the northern ones. So really, when it comes to the epidemiology, um, I think that the, the highlights here are that this is a parasite infection that is transmitted through the kissing bug, and it can happen through a bite, blood transfusions or transplantations, mother to fetus or oral contamination. Now, once the uh, parasite gets in the blood, um, it goes through the blood to house, if you want, in different um, organs in the body. And, and it's mostly on muscular cells, but not only. And not surprisingly then, the organs that will get the most infected are the heart and some other uh, organs in the digestive system, such as the colon or the esophagus. Um, what we see is that once the uh, parasite travels through the blood and, um, and houses, if you want, finds a house in the myocardial cells, they start reproducing. As they start reproducing, um, we, um, we, we notice inflammation. That inflammation can give a myocarditis. With time, that inflammation can turn into cell destruction and in fibrosis. So those are really the pathophysiological features that we're going to be aiming to with our imaging. Obviously, the description of this physiopathology can get much more complicated, but I am really trying to keep it centered on what we can do with imaging. So again, um, uh, we see in the very far left here uh, the parasite in the blood with some platelets around, and uh, through the blood it can go in the myocardium, as we see in the panel in the middle, with islands uh, full of the, the parasite, and eventually that turns uh, with inflammation into fibrosis that we can see in the panel mostly on the right. And that's really the history, if you want, from a physiopathological standpoint of Chagas disease in our hearts. So what all these phenomena will bring are, um, I, I, I try to keep it simple into three different groups. Autonomic dysfunction that will turn into uh, conduction abnormalities, uh, frequent ectopy in terms of atrial or ventricular ectopy, and those are things that we can look for with an EKG, a halter monitoring, a loop recorder, et cetera, uh, and with echocardiogram as well. In addition, myocardial damage obviously is probably the most um, uh, remarkable feature that we see in patients with Chagas heart disease. This turns into dysfunction, whether it's local or regional uh, dysfunction of the myocardium or global left ventricular dysfunction, uh, and it also turns into um, dyskinetic um, segments that eventually form into aneurysms. Those um, dysfunction and aneurysms can be very well seen with echocardiography and even better so with cardiac magnetic resonance. 
Microvascular dysfunction is the third uh, uh, most important feature, and what that will be is uh, inflammation of the, the cells on the arterioles and, um, uh, and the capillaries that will uh, produce ischemia. Now, interestingly enough, obviously that ischemia being on microvascular uh, territory may not be seen with a, a regular cardiac catheterization, and for that, we would be using uh, stress testing, whether it's nuclear, echocardiography, or uh, cardiac magnetic resonance. So let's go one by one and try to show some examples of uh, how imaging can help detect this um, uh, pathological phenomena. When it comes to autonomic dysfunction, uh, we will be seeing conduction abnormalities and ectopy. So electrocardiogram, halter monitoring, and echo are really the way we're going to go with them. This is very typical. This is a patient that actually Professor Aquatella, who has chaired the document uh, with me, um, has provided. This is a patient he has been following for many years. Uh, at 31 years of age, this patient uh, had a significant sinus bradycardia, and as you can see there, a very frequent uh, ventricular um, ectopy, PVCs in the form of ventricular bigeminy. And that's exactly what you can see on this patient already at age 31. The same patient 13 years later uh, has another electrocardiogram, and uh, this electrocardiogram shows now a right bundle branch block and a left anterior fascicular block together with the sinus pericardia that we have described before. And 10 years later, at age 54, the patient um, has further conduction abnormalities and um, more, if you want, in the pattern of a left uh, bundle branch block, which is not a complete, complete bundle branch block, but uh, clearly reflects um, abnormalities in the conduction system throughout. So the most common findings when it comes to electrocardiograms are a right bundle branch block uh, combined with left uh, anterior fascicular block, that is certainly the most common one, left bundle branch block, sinus node dysfunction with significant bradycardia, AV blocks, uh, and, and those last two um, are the frequent uh, indication for pacemakers on these patients, and then arrhythmias of different kind, whether it's PVCs or PACs, and eventually ventricular tachycardias and uh, atrial fibrillations can also happen. The electrical conduction abnormalities can also be seen um, as, uh, as we have uh, over the last 10, 15 years uh, been evaluating with echocardiography uh, on what we call the synchrony. Um, obviously, you can see in this case an M mode from a parasternal view, and you see a very delayed conduction of the inferolateral wall compared to the septum, and that delay uh, causes the synchrony and frequently comes with the conduction abnormalities. And to be a little bit more specific and more modern, if you want, um, we can actually um, do a similar analysis by um, evaluating um, more than one segment. In this case, we are showing a strain echocardiography mechanical dispersion. On the left side here, you can see that all segments are contracting on a very synchronous way. They tend to contract at the same time and relax at the same time, as opposed to what we see on the, which is normal, by the way, as opposed to what we see on the right side, which is a patient where there's kind of anarchy, if you want, on the contraction of the myocardium. Different segments tend to contract uh, later. Some of them even have uh, some degree of contraction after the aortic valve has closed. When it comes to myocardial damage, um, we are mostly looking at regional and global uh, ventricular dysfunction. And this could be the left ventricle or the right ventricle, both or one or, or, or the other. But also we see morphological changes, the most typical of which is an aneurysm. So um, going back to the physiology then, uh, this um, uh, Imaging modalities we're going to use are going to aim at detecting inflammation, edema, fibrosis, aneurysms and thrombus within those aneurysms, cardiomyopathy, or myocarditis, which could be acute uh, at the moment of the initial infection or chronic uh, myocarditis with cardiomyopathy. <laughs> 
Again, echocardiography and CMR are the, uh, the, the best methods to do that, and which one you are going to be using will depend on what is available at your institution. Let's dig a little bit deeper on this, left ventricular aneurysms. Apical aneurysms are really the hallmark lesion of Chagas heart disease, and it's probably, if you have heard anything about Chagas in the past, that's what you have heard, that a patient without coronary disease that has a focal aneurysm should be ruled out for Chagas disease. And I hope you keep that concept because it's extremely important. Um, however, not everyone has an aneurysm, and not, not everyone has the aneurysms in the apex. Actually, it can happen in any wall, such as the inferior or the inferior lateral walls, which are second and third in, um, in the frequency for aneurysm formations. Obviously, that area that is akinetic or dyskinetic and um, the stasis that happens in the aneurysm predisposes for left ventricular thrombus formation. So that's something we always look for in our patients with Chagas disease. And they can actually present even in relatively early stages of the disease before the patient has global left ventricular dysfunction. So let's see a few examples of this. Um, this case has a very clear aneurysm that is marked with a yellow arrow there on the uh, septal apical um, or apical septal segment and the inferior apical segment. You can see it very well. It is actually quite remarkable that the, the lesion is extremely focal. Uh, to the point that the global left ventricular function is probably normal and the right ventricular function is also normal. This still image that I'm showing uh, here shows a very large aneurysm in the um, mid and apical part of the inferior lateral wall and uh, marked there with the arrows are the, the beginning, if you want, on the mid-segment towards the, the apex that we cannot see perfectly well. Um, importantly, you see not only that there is an aneurysm, there's actually very significant thinning of the wall in that area, and that is definitely an area that has significant uh, inflammation and scar from the um, parasites located in that area. This is another example um, where the arrows are marking a, a, a very focal aneurysm in the basal portion of the inferior wall, again showing examples of different uh, ways um, an aneurysm can present in these patients. So this brings us to what is the role of echocardiography in patients with Chagas disease. Um, obviously, uh, and I don't need to um, to um, talk too much about this, uh, it is the most widely available methodology. is uh, cheap compared to other imaging modalities, so the lower cost and the portability of it makes it a very exciting tool uh, that can actually identify most, not all, but most of the typical findings of Chagas disease. So we use echocardiography to evaluate for left ventricular and right ventricular morphology and systolic function, to evaluate diastolic function, to evaluate valvular disease that can happen as a result of the cardiomyopathy, to evaluate the synchrony, as I showed before, and um, to um, uh, determine the presence of pericardial effusion in some cases. This is a patient that we actually saw at a Washington Hospital Center in, uh, in D.C., um, again, to highlight that these things are present in the United States and we should all be aware. This uh, young gentleman, 25-year-old, uh, that came from El Salvador several years ago, presented to the hospital with a stroke. The uh, echocardiogram, uh, you can see it in this screen, uh, at least a parasternal long view, with uh, overall it seems to be normal um, left ventricular function, but we don't see the apex very well. The EKG had a right bundle branch block and left anterior fascicular block. So again, someone coming from an endemic area with the EKG findings that are very suggestive or, or, or very consistent with Chagas disease and presents with a CVA. So we definitely want to make sure this patient doesn't have focal aneurysms despite having normal global LV function. 
Indeed, this is the apical four-chamber view, and I think we will all agree that the left ventricular function seems to be normal overall, and the right ventricular function is normal as well. But because of the concern of um, of the possibility of Chagas disease and, and maybe small aneurysms, we actually did uh, an echo contrast injection, an ultrasound enhancement agent injection, and now you can see the yellow arrow pointing at a very small focal apical aneurysm. Um, luckily enough, well, I'm not going to say luckily enough, but uh, interestingly enough, this um, aneurysm didn't have a clot, didn't have a thrombus inside. But maybe it was uh, there a few days before when the patient presented with a stroke. But with contrast, we were able to localize um, an aneurysm that was not seen uh, on a regular echo simply because the apex was not that well seen. Eventually, now with a very clear concern of Chagas disease, this patient had a, a cardiac uh, MRI. And you can see very nicely now that very small uh, apical aneurysm without a thrombus. This is a non-contrast cine um, uh, MRI. Um, and uh, this brings us to uh, what this patient did not have, at least on the day of the echo on the MRI, but may have had before, which is the presence of thrombus. Um, you can see here three different examples. The moving picture on the Left side is actually a very large apical aneurysm, very uh, akinetic or dyskinetic apex, and you can see very well the echogenic structure, uh, the very large mural thrombus that is present. The other two are not moving pictures, but I think they are good enough to um, show what we want to show. Um, the one in the middle is a contrast injection with a filling defect in the apex, again, a very large apical aneurysm with a thrombus in the apex. And the one at the very right is the same patient that I showed you before with a, um, an inferior apical, very discrete aneurysm, a normal function overall, but there within the, um, the aneurysm you can see uh, a thrombus formation. One other important aspect of aneurysms in this population is that frequently we, we fail to include the aneurysm in the, um, in the 2D image or even on the 3D image on our ultrasound uh, window. And um, this is important because the reality is that if we are to do any kind of quantitative analysis, whether it is um, a method of this, the Simpsons method for volumes or ejection fraction, or if we are planning on doing a strain analysis, we frequently enough will not be able to use the apex in this analysis. And you can see very clearly here that we are going beyond the ultrasound uh, sector, actually. And in this case, we even have to amputate the whole apical part because we cannot capture the apex, um, the an aneurysmatic apex properly. Um, this brings us again to cardiac magnetic resonance, and I showed you already the moving picture there uh, without contrast, showing a very small um, aneurysm. After we uh, injected gadolinium on this patient, late gadolinium enhancement is showing this cap there in the apex that is um, uh, um, an indication of uh, fibrosis or scar. Um, that is, is really the, the, the pathology behind the, the formation of that aneurysm. Uh, and we can see a little bit of, uh, of uh, hyperenhancement also on the inferior wall. So really, cardiac MRI is, excellent, is an excellent tool for global and regional evaluation of the anatomy. Remember, these aneurysms are not always that big, so we need to be very careful on the way we... Uh, we, we evaluate them. Uh, it's uh, excellent for global and regional world motion and function and, and also for tissue characterization, as I showed you uh, in the, those images of, um, of fibrosis or um, by using T2 um, sequences, we can even see uh, edema in many of these cases in more acute settings. 
Um, this is um, um, a classic uh, graph that I took from uh, one of the MRI textbooks, uh, really to mark the difference between what you what we see um, as a hyper enhancement pattern in ischemic heart disease, where the pattern starts in the subendocardium and from there grows, if you want, outwards to the mid wall and the um, Epicardium that is different from many other infiltrative diseases and cardiomyopathies, such as Chagas disease, where most typically we see um, these areas of hyperenhancement uh, affecting the mid wall or the epicardium, but preserving the uh, the uh, subendocardium. Obviously. In any of these diseases, including Chagas disease, you can see a transmural um, uh, fibrosis, in which case it, it may look more like the transmural infarct that we see here, but frequently uh, we, we can make a distinction on the fact that it does not necessarily respect one of the coronary territories and it goes beyond that. Um, this is uh, what we uh, fear as the end stage of the cardiomyopathy. This is a pathology uh, that Dr. Migliori from Argentina shared as a, as a picture um, in, in our writing group. And uh, you can see clearly here that the walls of the left ventricle are very thin. Um, that is the result of very extensive cardiomyopathy, a lot of trabeculations, a lot of different spaces there were in the setting of multiple trabeculations and um, low flow because of the cardiomyopathy, uh, clots can form there. So you don't necessarily need a, um, uh, an aneurysm to form a clot. You can have mural thrombus uh, form as well. And uh, I think an important thing to mention about the cardiomyopathy is that um, we frequently in advanced stages see dilation of all four chambers, but many times we only see a dilated left ventricle with a dilated left, left atrium, or in some cases the left ventricle is not that affected and the dilation is more prominent on the right um, heart chambers. As for any other um, uh, condition, uh, 3D methods are always preferred when it comes to evaluating the real shape of the ventricles, uh, whether we're talking about the left ventricle or the left atrium or uh, when we're talking about the right ventricle, 3D echo, um, uh, cardiac magnetic resonance, or even um, uh, cardiac CT could help on identifying abnormalities both on the shape and the function of the um, uh, cardiac chambers. And strain is um, uh, um, a newer methodology, if you want, that aims at detecting left ventricular dysfunction earlier on, as it happens with um, uh, cardiotoxic drugs and so forth. Uh, and it's not different in this setting. Uh, we can detect patients with abnormal strain that still have normal ejection fraction. So it's a way of detecting early uh, cardiomyopathy or even regional uh, variation. When it comes to microvascular dysfunction, I think it is important that the concept of ischemia is different from that one in coronary, in classic coronary disease. The, the, uh, the great arteries, the great coronary arteries may actually not be affected and just be a microvascular dysfunction. So the ischemic testing may actually have a higher yield than a cardiac catheterization. Um, whether we do it with nuclear testing, with echo, or with cardiac MRI, any of these methods can uh, provide a good um, a good uh, means for evaluation of ischemia. Um, I'm not going to show too many examples of this, but I think this one is actually a really good one. It comes from an article that one of our co-authors uh, participated on um, in Jack Imaging back in 2009. And what you can see here is that on a single individual, the stress image shows a defect area, perfusion uh, uh, abnormality that on redistribution gets at least partially reversed uh, with a significant improvement. Now, the same patient, six and a half years later, shows that the baseline, uh, sorry, that the, um, the stress um, uh, defect actually has 
uh, grown, and not only that, uh, that area that has grown has no uh, reversibility in, in in the majority of its uh, of its space. So, what this uh, basically speaks of is that yes, um, uh, Chagas disease can induce ischemia without uh, having necessarily um, uh, coronary artery disease at a macrovascular level, but only at microvascular, and that over time that ischemia will increase in the size and also in its severity to turn into irreversible defects. So with this, I'm going to turn into question number two for you to Paul. And um, the question is, which of the following is the most common finding in early stages of Chagas heart disease? Again, which of the following is the most common finding in early stages of Chagas heart disease? Is that apical aneurysms, right ventricular dysfunction, conduction abnormalities and ectopy, low left ventricular ejection fraction, or I am not sure, maybe I can answer after the webinar today. Again, I will give you um, a few seconds and then I will move on. So the key here is um, to answer this question is that we're talking about the early stages of Chagas heart disease. And the most common finding is electrical problems, uh, whether it's conduction abnormalities, and as, as we mentioned before, right bundle branch block, left anterior fascicular block, significant ectopy in terms of PACs or PVCs, all those are actually the most common initial findings. Um, for the disease, and, and most of you have recognized that uh, on your answers to the question. That brings us to um, description of the, what, how we stage Chagas heart disease or, or Chagas disease. Um, Chagas disease can be staged into an acute stage, uh, a silent indeterminate stage that some call stage A, and then B1 and B2 are stages where there is some um, um, cardiomyopathy uh, that lead eventually to stages C and D where uh, there is symptomatic. So basically what you can see here is there is an acute infection with trypanosoma cruzi. Uh, that infection turns into a chronic infection that initially uh, stays as a, um, a latent infection, a silent infection, and only some of the patients, about um, 20 to 30 percent, will progress from the silent Chagas infection into stage B1, which is the cardiomyopathy. Uh, cardiomyopathy, B1 and B2 are different. We're going to see how is that they are different, but they are still asymptomatic. And only when the disease is more advanced, turns into stages C and D, which reflect heart failure or refractory heart failure. What we commonly call Chagas cardiomyopathy is any of the stages that you see there in the triangle from B1 on uh, to advanced uh, stages. So in, a, in acute Chagas disease, uh, it is important to understand that most of the time we may not actually be able to uh, diagnose that. The, um, the presentation, the clinical presentation is is, is most likely to be a flu-like presentation. That the, if I have to say that the, if there is one characteristic of it is that usually it, uh, it's a, it's a flu-like um, uh, illness that lasts a little bit longer than usual, can last uh, even up to uh, five or six weeks long. Um, in some cases, a minority, um, they have what is called a Romania sign, which is an orbital edema. Uh, one of the two eyes um, uh, has a, an inflammatory response with a significant edema around the eye, but that is not present uh, in the majority of patients. And when it comes to the heart, it presents usually as a, um, uh, either a myocarditis or a pericarditis, and that pericarditis may present with pericardial effusion and in some few cases even with cardiac tamponade, as you can see on the images I'm showing here. The one in the center really shows a delayed hyperenhancement from an MRI that shows um, uh, um, 
um, uh, acute myocarditis, and then the moving picture uh, is one with normal left ventricular and right ventricular function, but with some pericardial effusion and even some collapse of the right atrium there. Now, on, on further imaging this patient, you can see that the inferior vena cava is very dilated, it's barely collapsing with um, with uh, inspiration, and uh, therefore there is a concern for early stages of tamponade. This is actually a case, again, from Professor Aquatella uh, on actually a series that he published of acute infection that happened due to oral contamination um, with um, uh, an infected juice in a, in a, in a group of, uh, of kids at school. Um, you can see in the, in the same case that the um, uh, Parasternal long axis view with M mode shows very clearly that even during diastole, there is still some pushing in of the free wall of the right ventricle, again suggesting early signs of tamponade and some variation during the inspiration and expiration cycle. So this patient did have early signs of tamponade. So in acute Chagas disease, is something we need to suspect in terms of the recommendations. We should suspect it when patients present with flu-like presentation, usually lasting longer than a regular flu, um, with any kind of evidence or suggestion of myocarditis or pericard pericarditis that is happening in endemic areas. Um, if the patient has EKG changes, such as ST, wave um, ST changes or T wave abnormalities, uh, then we need to think in those endemic areas that the patient may have Chagas disease. So a TTE can help at least on determining how much the heart may or may not be affected and whether it's a pericardial effusion. The uh, indeterminate stage, I called it before, is a subclinical infection. So patients are positive in terms of serology, but they have no clinical problems and their hearts are at least normal based on regular evaluation. Um, this, uh, the important thing when it comes to our recommendations is that we want to make sure that if this patient is to convert from the silent uh, indeterminate stage into uh, stage B1, um, then that we can capture that uh, early. And uh, we need to understand that the rate of conversion from uh, indeterminate to B1 is anywhere between 1% a year and 5% a year, depending on the, the kind of, of parasite they have, the area, the, their immune uh, system, et cetera. So really, we should be checking EKGs on a regular basis to detect those conduction abnormalities and, and, uh, and ectopy. And every now and then, we can do a trans echo echo. Um, uh, to look for wall motion abnormalities, for abnormal strain, or right ventricular dysfunction. So uh, our recommendations would be if a patient has uh, a positive te serological test for Chagas, do an EKG every year or two um, to detect things early, and every few years uh, we can do a trans echo. That's not something that needs to be done on a yearly basis, but maybe every few years particularly in the case of an abnormal EKG or if the patient develops any kind of symptoms that is suggestive of heart disease. Stage B1 is now when we start talking about cardiomyopathy. And the important thing of B1 as opposed to B2 is that there is cardiomyopathy, but the global left ventricular function is still normal. Okay, So there is cardiomyopathy, it still doesn't affect the left ventricular function uh, as a totality. Uh, and I show you examples of that. Uh, one could be um, our patient from the beginning of the presentation that already had um, significant PACs and bradyarrhythmias. That is already a marker of cardiac problem. There is some cardiomyopathy, but the ejection fraction was normal. Um, if the patient presents with uh, conduction abnormalities such as right bundle branch block and left anterior fascicular block, this is again that same patient, but also the young El Salvadorian patient that I showed you uh, that came with a stroke. That patient had a right bundle and a left anterior fascicular block and could have been detected earlier. Um, and obviously, the, um, the presence of a very focal uh, regional wall motion abnormality still having normal left ventricular function, that is also considered a stage B1. Um, 
So once uh, the recommendation is that once the EKG is abnormal or regional wall motion abnormalities are documented, we need to monitor for global left ventricular and right ventricular function, and that should be done on a yearly basis. So an echo every year is a reasonable approach at this time. B2 um, is a progression, and now what it means is that the cardiomyopathy is affecting the left ventricular um, global function. So now we, we are not limited just to EKG changes or a small aneurysm here or there, but rather the entire left ventricular function is affected. Uh, and this would be a case of a much more advanced um, uh, patient with Charles heart disease. Uh, this is B2 so far as there is no symptoms. Once the patient actually has symptoms, that turns into later stages such as CMD. So um, the goals of imaging in these stages are to detect substrate for heart failure, such as left ventricular function or dysfunction, valvular disease, right ventricular dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction, etc. And also to monitor the cardiomyopathy and adjust medical therapies, cardiac medical therapies as needed, such as beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, spironolactone, etc. B2, um, is, um, as I mentioned before, then the recommendation is an yearly echo or cardiac MRI and to look for all the different features that we have been talking about, including right ventricular function, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, pulmonary hypertension, and all the different consequences of the um, uh, ventricular dysfunction. And then we come to the symptomatic stages, uh, stage C, which is heart failure, and stage D, when, when the heart failure is refractory to usual medical treatments. The goals of imaging here are to detect the substrate for heart failure, for thromboembolism, and for malignant uh, arrhythmia. So again, as I showed before, we are looking for aneurysms where uh, arrhythmias uh, may, may trigger, where that may justify remodeling of the ventricle and, and global left ventricular dysfunction, presence of thrombus, etc. But also, we are looking at the myocardium itself with cardiac magnetic resonance to look for um, uh, fibrosis and scarring of the tissue. So the recommendation is to do an yearly echo or CMR, and maybe more than yearly, depending on the case, and we will look for progression of all the different features that we have been talking about recently. So with that, uh, I'm going to finish with a uh, question number three, which is making the diagnosis of Chagas disease is irrelevant in which of the following stages of the disease? Acute Chagas disease in the terminate stage, asymptomatic, stages B1 or 2, advanced heart failure, such as stage D, or it is always important as it can change management on any of the stages. And I'll give you a few more seconds to answer. And the answer is E. It is always important because the reality is that having the diagnosis of Chagas as the cause of the cardiomyopathy can actually change your management at every single one of the stages. Using antiparasitic drugs such as benzonidazole or so, uh, it, it actually has the highest yield in the early stages because it, it may prevent the progression to um, uh, later stages of the disease. Uh, however, even in very advanced stages, there is a role for knowing that the patient has Chagas disease. For example, that may play a role on putting the patient on a list for a transplantation. Or even after the transplant has happened, uh, it is very important to understand that Chagas disease um, could reactivate. So we have to be um, surveilling these patients that have been transplanted and now are immunosuppressed. They can actually reactivate. So it's even important once the patient has been already transplanted and has a normal functioning heart. So it's always important. So with that, I want to uh, come to my conclusions. Um, Chagas disease is nowadays present in traditionally non-endemic areas, such as the U.S. and Europe. Um, awareness is critical to early diagnosis of Chagas heart disease before left ventricular dysfunction um, develops. Echocardiography and electrocardiogram are the low-cost, widely available diagnostic tools of choice for routine surveillance in patients from endemic areas. 
and advanced imaging techniques can detect substrate for high-risk conditions, such as aneurysms, left ventricular dysfunction, th uh, mural thrombus, myocardial fibrosis, and scar. Monitoring of cardiac chamber morphology and function is important to guide usual medical and device therapies for dilated cardiomyopathy. With that, I want to thank you all uh, for being here on this webinar. We're going to give some time for um, uh, questions at the end uh, in, in, in a minute or two. And I wanted to um, particularly thank the American Society of Echocardiography for putting together this group of experts that could not have happened without the collaboration with our uh, partner societies, ECOSIAC and Brazilian Society of Cardiology, and not only them, but actually a, a, a very large group of uh, echo and cardiology societies from around the world that have reviewed this document once it, it has been um, uh, written and they uh, decided that it was significant enough for their people um, and they decided to endorse it. And with that, I am talking about the Argentinian Federation of Cardiology, the Argentinian Society of Cardiology, British Society of ECHO, Chinese Society of ECHO, uh, ECHO section of the Cuban Society of Cardiology, the Venezuelan Society of Cardiology, the Indian Academy of ECHO, uh, Iranian Society of ECHO, Japanese Society, Mexican Society, and the Saudi Arabian Society of ECHO Cardiography. So to all of them, I really want to thank. This is a very important uh, first of a kind, if you want, guideline that the ASC is doing with collaborating societies in trying to address diseases that are not that prevalent in the United States but are very relevant to um, our membership uh, around the globe. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, check on the questions and answers, and I will try to take um, uh, I will take a few of them on the few minutes that we have left. Um, so it says myocardial damage only once patient is in advanced stage. Well, I think we, we talked about that. Uh, myocardial damage um, can present in, uh, in the B1 stage where uh, the global left ventricular function is still normal. So it is not that advanced, but the reality is that this is late in the disease. And remember that only about 30% of the patients that get into the indeterminate phase will actually progress to a, um, a B1 or, or a stage where cardiomyopathy actually happens. Um, uh, there's a second question. Is there any role for imaging in detecting ischemia in Chagas disease to differentiate this cardiomyopathy from coronary heart disease? Um, Yes, I think there are different features that can distinguish one from the other, but obviously um, the, the, the point that I've been making through this presentation is that the coronary disease that happened because of Chagas disease is mostly microvascular disease. So you may actually see that the, the, the main coronary arteries are fine, but there is still ischemia. So finding ischemia with no obvious uh, big atherosclerotic disease is a typical finding of Chagas. Now, obviously, any of these patients uh, uh, with Chagas disease could also have coronary disease on top of it. So one thing doesn't rule out the other one, but I think that answers the question. Let's see. Um, question number three. Can you diagnose if the patient is infected with Chagas parasite acute via blood work? or how can presence of parasite be determined without imaging? Well, as a matter of fact, imaging cannot determine parasite, and there are many different ways that you can, um, that, that, that you will make the diagnosis of Chagas. Uh, you can do it uh, with um, um, uh, serology of different kinds. There's different tests, and usually you have to have two different serologies to be able to make your diagnosis but uh, uh, that can also be done with um, uh, a Buffy code uh, testing or with PCR, which is much more uh, specific if you want. There are many different testing, even rapid tests nowadays to make the diagnosis. But in the very acute setting, many of, most of these uh, tests may actually be negative and you may have to test the patient a few weeks uh, later. Um, uh, uh, there's a question about treatment, uh, uh, and, and I will say that that's really beyond the scope of, of this presentation, but again, as I mentioned briefly, the earlier you diagnose this problem, 
the more impact you can have by giving benzimidazole or any other antiparasitic treatment that is specific to the disease. Later on, you just have to treat the heart failure. Uh, and, and obviously, there is room for different drugs, but uh, it's going to be mostly treating heart failure. Um, is there value to assessment of diastolic function in Chagas disease? Will it be helpful in guiding treatment? Well, diastolic function may actually explain the uh, uh, presentation of heart failure in some patients that may not necessarily have significant left ventricular dysfunction. Um, similarly to what it can happen to any other dilated cardiomyopathy, there is certainly a role for diastolic function. There is a role for doing a, a, a basic hemodynamic evaluation with the echo Doppler, uh, such as trying to understand what the left atrial pressures are, what the pulmonary systolic pressure is, and so forth. So yes, there is uh, room for those, and we, we can have an impact on them. Um, which is the best imaging modality for the detection of LV thrombus? I would say the answer to that, the short answer is uh, cardiac magnetic resonance. Uh, and the reason for that is when the thrombus are very large, we can see them even with our, with our eyes closed. <laughs> um, so yes, an echo can see it, an echo with contrast would even be better, and even better than that will be an MRI because it can actually detect much smaller thrombus, um, even if it happens uh, a mural thrombus that is not necessarily in an area of an aneurysm. Um, is there studies on contrast agent, agents, perfusion in Chagas? Yes, there are studies. There are small studies coming from single institutions, mostly in uh, in Latin America, um, and again, it points out to the point that, uh, or, or to the fact that these patients will have ischemia because of microvascular disease. So it's not going to show the coronary disease, the classic coronary disease, but it will show um, uh, areas, even small areas of perfusion defects. And then there are a couple of questions that I can see here. Is Chagas disease curable? Um, let's put it this way. What is preventable is the development of Chagas cardiomyopathy. But for that, we need to be able to identify our infected patients early on in their disease. That's why the very, very most important thing we can do for our patients coming from endemic areas, whether they live still in South or Central America, or they are now living in the United States or Europe or wherever you are located, the most important thing is that we try to detect them early. Be aware of the conduction abnormalities that can happen, the typical small aneurysms that can happen even in the setting of normal left ventricular function. And I showed you a very good case that we had in our own hospital um, in, in Washington, D.C., with normal EF and a very tiny apical aneurysm that eventually turned into a stroke. Clearly, um, uh, this patient would have been better off diagnosed earlier and given some um, antiparasitic treatment, uh, such as uh, it could be benzonidazole. So curable, it's, I don't think it's totally curable. It's definitely a lot we can do. We can um, uh, turn these patients in, in remission. Um, and, uh, and to tell you the truth, uh, we have seen cases in our hospital of patients that have been transplanted and after having an LBAT for several years have been transplanted and then they have reactivation uh, once they are immunosuppressed. We have a couple of those cases already, and when these patients now get reactivated, meaning not that they have a cardiomyopathy again, but they, they have positive serologies again, then you can uh, give a specific treatment for the parasite that can bring them in remission again, and indeed it has happened in our patients. Okay. So with that, I think we are about to uh, hit the hour. I think we answered uh, a lot of questions. I really hope that 
the main messages that we wanted to convey about how important it is to screen, to be aware of this disease, and what we can do from an imaging standpoint to have an impact on our patients' uh, outcomes has all been uh, clear, and, uh, and I hope no one thinks of this disease at this point as only a disease of Brazil, Argentina, and a few countries in South America. It can really affect any of our patients, uh, even in the United States. With that, I want to thank you, everyone, and, um, uh, um, and have a good day. Thank you for participating in this afternoon's webinar, and a special thanks to Dr. Ash for presenting on behalf of ASE. As a reminder, the instructions to claim your CME can be downloaded from the resource section in the lower left of the viewer. Thank you again for participating in today's webinar. Have a good day.